So brothers and sisters, I just want to take this time to welcome my brother Peter. Peter ministers in the island of Mauritius. But he's a man we have walked together everywhere. And I believe that tonight, today he's going to be a blessing. Put your hands together. Welcome the man of God. Hallelujah. And when he says everywhere, he means everywhere. We have been all over Africa together, all over Europe, all over the States. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey. Because I believe that when you give your life to Jesus, it's a journey. It's not a destination. It's a journey. And we've been called and chosen by God. Isn't that good news? When I look at you, some of you, I don't think I would call or chose, choose you. Would you choose your neighbor? You can be honest with me because we're in church this morning. But there are many people we look in the church and we think, Lord, why did you choose him? Why did you choose them? But the fact is God chose all of us. Not because of what we can do. It's not because of my ability. It's not because of my good looks. <laughs> uh, it's not because of my achievements. My intellect. Which I am a bit short. But it's because of his plan for my life. And you know, many Christians believe that his plan for our lives is what we do for him. And we forget it's what he does with us. That's his plan. He has purchased us. We belong to him. We're slaves. We're servants. It's amazing how we're a servant of God and yet we, we tell God what to do so many times. Did you hear me? We call it prayer. And we demand of God. And we, we tell God what to do. And when to do it. And how to do it. But we're servants. Have you ever heard a servant telling the master what to do? I don't think so. But the servant comes before the master and says, Lord, what do you want to do? It's amazing. It's amazing to think when you look at the apostle Paul. That just when he was doing so well in his life, in his ministry. It was God's plan for Paul to go to jail. He was just about to write a book. He had just signed a new TV series. But now he had to go to jail. It was the last thing anybody would want to do. But it was God's plan. That's the way God works. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 11, his ways are beyond our understanding. Beyond finding out. Inexpressible. It's amazing. And we need to realize that. And we need to see that we belong to God. How many of you got to the announcements today? Okay. The announcements are given. I'm not advertising your church. Okay. But the announcements are given for you to read and to follow. Yes or no? But I was watching one delightful little boy here. In fact, two little boys here who found a better purpose for the announcements. They made airplanes. And I'm quite sure that if mother wasn't watching, those airplanes would be flying around the auditorium. But they had to go off to children's church. And I'm sure, I don't know if, it's, if they still could have the airplanes, but I, I would suggest if they have them at the end of the meeting, you take them upstairs because they would get a really good flight. <laughs> but you see, that's what little boys do. That's what little children do. They don't look at what this is all about. They think that what they can use it for. And that's what many Christians do with the Word of God. They look at the Bible and they look at the promises to try and find what they can get out of them for them. Instead of realizing that we need to serve the Lord. And we belong to God. And God's got a plan and purpose for our life. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, 1, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I was reminded when our sister Dawn was singing the song, Hosanna, that uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he was riding on a donkey. And all the people there bowed down and worshipped. Worshipped, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. You know that. And it would have been very strange if the donkey had thought the worship was for him. It was for Jesus. And uh, it's so strange in the church world today that we give so much applause and Hosanna to the preacher when he's just a donkey. <laughs> 
Sorry, Pastor. <laughs> Just bringing the life of Christ in obedience. And if you remember the story, Jesus had said to his disciples before going into Jerusalem, go into Jerusalem and you will find a donkey. And when you find the donkey, tell the owner of the donkey that it's for me and he'll give it to you. And that's exactly what happened. They went in, they got the donkey, and the owner said, what are you doing? And, and they said to the owner, this is for Jesus. And the owner said, okay, I understand. Because God had made a way, God had planned. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing. Can you say nothing? nothing. No. We need to realize that God is a God. And He has a plan and He has a purpose. For the foundations of the world, He has a plan for the church. And He has a plan for my life and He has a plan for your life. And when we're born again, we enter into that plan. We enter into His will. We enter into what He has for our lives. And so it's important that we realize that the way we begin is the way we continue. And we know that we are born again by faith. So if we start with faith, we must what? Continue in faith. Now Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and he says uh, in the... The Spirit expressly says that in the last days, some will depart from the faith and they'll give in to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. He's not talking to people in the world. He's talking to people in the church. He's warning us that in the times in which we're living, there are deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons. There are teachings from the Word of God that come to distract us from what? Faith. The faith of God. The faith that we need in our life to serve God. And there are many things. And we need to see that and get a hold of it. Now look with me to chapter 6, verse 6. Where he says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. You understand the word contentment? It means to be content. <laughs> That's simple. In other words, we're not reaching out for other things, we're content with what we have. Which reminds me of the scripture where Jesus said, man shall not live by what? Things. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and the things shall be what? Added to you. We're not to have faith for things. Material things, natural things, carnal things, fleshly things. Our faith needs to be in God for our life. For what He has purposed, what He has planned. So He says in verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. As my old friend used to say, Coffins do not have pockets and there's no place for your wallet. The way you came into this world with nothing is the way you will leave. With nothing. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> and yet people spend so much of their life trying to get. And even trying to believe God and putting their faith in God for something that's better, bigger, greater, more important. Instead of being content with what we have and letting God add to our lives what we need. That's the difference between reading the announcements and turning the announcements into a paper airplane. That's childish. And unfortunately in the church today, many Christians are childish. They don't allow themselves to grow into maturity. When things go wrong in their life, they're like children. What does a child do when he's uncertain or he doesn't know? He says, why? It's amazing. A parent can say to a little boy, it's time for you to get out of bed. Why? Well, you need to go to school. Why? Well, you must learn. Why? Just get dressed. Why? So that you can come and eat your food. Why? So that you can go to school. Why? And I'm sure we've all experienced the whys. Because he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. He just sees what he needs for himself. He can't understand what the parent is thinking or planning. And many Christians are the same. And we're so, we're so obsessive with the natural things. 
with the state of our health, with the state of our finance, with what we wear, what we drive, how we live, what type of job, where we go, what we do. And we forget that God is something much, much greater, much greater for our lives. That's why he says in verse 8, having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And that's what deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons are. They're snares. They're true. They're, they're truths in the scripture that are taken out of context. And they're laid by the, the snare of the devil himself. And he disguises. That's what a snare is. You don't see the trap before you walk into it. And there are many Christians that are snared by doctrines, snared by teachings that distract them away from the plan of God for their life. And God's plan for your life, my brothers and sisters, is very simple and very clear. You are to be conformed to the image of Christ. If you're looking for anything else, you're going in the wrong direction. And what God has begun, He will what? Complete. So when you're born again, you come into that plan and you enter on that road and that journey. God has something great for your life. Something for you to discover. And He puts faith in your heart which enables you to avoid the snares, avoid the traps, avoid the deceptions, and to keep your heart and your life focused on what God has for you. You know, I was reminded this morning, just that we were having a time of worship here, about a man called Caleb. If you read Numbers chapter 13 and 14, you'll find out that Caleb was one of the 12 spies that went or was sent into Israel, the promised land. And he came back with Joshua, and the Bible says he had a good report. Ten of the spies had a bad report. Because let me tell you something, we will always be a minority. We'll always be a minority. All of those men belonged to the house of Israel, but only two of them had a faith that set them apart. And I believe it's the same today. The church is caught up with all the natural things. But God wants to set apart a people who will be founded, grounded in faith that are not looking at the natural things and not fearful of what's going on around them but are focused on what God has planned for them to grow to become mature and to be a blessing in the world and a blessing to the people of God so Caleb said guys what's your problem here what's the problem here why are we worrying about the size of the giants I mean a giant's a giant what's the problem what's the problem why are we worrying about the enemy yes we're not trained soldiers Yes, we don't, we've never been into battles like this before. Yes, we'll be outnumbered, outweighed. Yes, all of these things, but who cares? If God be for us, who can be against us? And unfortunately, Moses gave in to the majority, as many church leaders do. That went down well. Huh? Gave in to the majority. But it's amazing when you read of Caleb, you find in Numbers chapter 13, then you jump to Joshua chapter 14. And after they had gone into the promised land, they defeated the enemy. Caleb now comes to Joshua and says, now listen, when I was 40 years old, we went into the promised land. We came out defeated. Now I am 85 years old. So there's, there's hope for you, sir. <laughs> now I'm 85 years old. That mountain was given by God to me. He didn't choose it. He didn't look at a map and put a pin on it and say, oh, I'll, think I'll have that one. He was given by God to me. I don't care about my age. I don't care about my frailty. I don't care about the circumstances. Caleb says, that's my mountain. That's my mountain. That's the faith of God. That's the faith of God. Can you imagine what it'd be like as Caleb to spend 40 years in a wilderness with negative, moaning, grumbling people and still come through with faith. Come on, guys. Huh? Some of us marry mumbling, grumbling people. Some of us have given birth to mumbling, grumbling people. Some of us come to a church and sit next to mumbling, grumbling people. But God's looking for faith. Faith. So what does he say in verse 11? You, O man of God, 
Flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. When he says flee these things, he means turn your back. Don't even contemplate. Don't even think about it. Turn your back. Flee these things. There are plenty of Christians who are looking for the gain, looking for the material things, looking for the blessings. He says flee these things. He didn't say stand and think about it. He didn't say stand and pray about it. He said what? Run away. Like Joseph ran away from the wife of Potiphar. Joseph could smell the problem. And he took that garment off and he was out of there like a flash. <laughs> but Christians today, what do they do? They stand and listen. And they listen a bit more. And very soon their faith is all over the place and they've lost sight of what God has for their life. So what does he say, verse 12? Fight the good fight of what? Faith. The fight that we're fighting, what we're contending for, which is the proper word in the Greek, what we're contending for is what? Faith. To stay in faith. Why? Because we want to lay hold on eternal life. What about you this morning is eternal? Your suit? Earrings? <laughs> huh? What about you is eternal? Your car. Who's going to heaven with your car? Anybody? What about you is eternal? There's nothing about you but your self. Your life. So he's talking about laying hold on eternal life. And having faith. The fight that we have is to stay in faith. We're not using our faith to fight for things. Are you there? We're not using our faith to fight for things. We're not using our faith to get what we want. We're fighting to stay in faith. And like it or not, life throws some very unfair, unjust, tough situations our way. And we can't be people who, who want to ignore and just want to ra run away from these things. Problems come in marriage. I was listening to this precious couple. How long have you been married? Three weeks. Three, a month. So far. And you're still smiling. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when I got married, we went on honeymoon. We went, trauma, tragedy. It comes. Don't sit there like angels thinking that I'm not telling the truth. But it's fact. And the longer you're married, Stephen, I'm, I beat Stephen by one month. He's been married, for, we'll be both married next year 40 years. 40 years. But I'll be one month older, more mature than him. <laughs> We've gone through many fires. Not just in our marriage, not just with the family. We've gone through fires. Any man working with him, you go through a fire. You go through struggles, you go through storms. But you see, one of the things that we need to understand as Christians today... What we have to understand clearly is that God never delivered anybody out of their problem. Never, never, never. In fact, God always put them in there in the first place. You look at the life of Daniel and you think he was a righteous man. A righteous man. A man that was given to the things of God. Daniel. You know the Daniel in the book? Huh? Given to the things of God. And yet God allows him, because of his righteousness, God allows him to get thrown into the lions. Now I know that when I was at Sunday school, we had lovely little pictures of Daniel sitting next to the lions and stroking them like cats. I don't think it was like that at all. <laughs> I'm telling you. A lion is a lion. Claws are claws and bad breath is bad breath. There was fear, there were doubts, there were questions. I'm sure because he was a human guy. But let me tell you, he was still in one piece the next day. And God did not deliver him. God protected him. God took him through. Why? Because when the king came the next day and saw Daniel still alive, he said, this nation will worship God because of the faith of Daniel. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. The three Hebrew boys found themselves in the fiery furnace. And they said to the king, if God delivers us, we will serve him. If he doesn't, we will serve him. 
They weren't looking for a way out. They were looking for a way through. And Jesus met them in the fiery furnace. And many Christians never experience the real touch of God in their life because they don't want to get into the fiery furnace. They'll resist. They'll fight. They'll justify. They'll explain. They'll take the fiery furnace and cast it into the sea. But let me tell you, when you wake up in the morning, she's still there. Did you hear me? You'll pray at night over your husband. You'll pray at night over your wife. You can put oil on him when he's sleeping. You can make the cross this way, that way, whatever way you want. You can put the holy handkerchief on him. You can put the scriptures wherever he can find them. But let me tell you something. Only God can change him. And when Moses went to Pharaoh with faith in his heart and he said, let my people go. He was full of excitement because God had said, Moses, I'm with you. And what happened? God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Not once, not twice, not three, not four, ten times, twelve times. But Moses had faith. Let my people go. What would we do? We'd give up. We pray and we say, Lord, change my husband. And he's worse. And we think, what's going on here? What's going on? How come? It seems, Pastor, that the more I pray for my husband, the worse he gets. The more I pray for my son, the worse he gets. Yes. God's got a plan for your life. He wants faith to grow. He wants faith to stay same, constant, firm, perseverant. Hallelujah. Huh? I tell you, I tell you, I wish I had a magic wand. Just come here. Want your problem fixed? I would just tap it on your head in Jesus' name. Bing! And you'd be, you'd be different. If I could do that, you'd be paying me a lot of money. But it's not like that. God can bring a miracle. God can bring a miracle. That's for sure. You know, one day my wife, she used to, to, to breed ducks and chickens to help with the finances. We were going through a bit of a tough time. And uh, I remember she came to me one morning and she said, uh, I don't have any duck food. I said, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Your ducks? Your problem. I've got enough problems. I've got enough problems. They're your ducks? Your problem. I know it wasn't a good attitude. I know. So I drove off. And during the course of the morning, we lived in the northern suburbs. We were staying in Zimbabwe at the time. We lived in the northern suburbs. And a, and a truck came from the farmer's co-op. And it, it took the wrong turn down our little road, which is a residential street. And now the truck was stuck. So he was trying to reverse because it was a, a one way. So he was trying to reverse. And in the process, he banged our gate. And as he banged the gate, a 50 kg bag of grain fell <laughs> at the gate. So I, 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 he, was, he didn't know what to do. So he came to my wife and he says, look, I'm sorry, I've, I've messed your gate and I've dropped all this grain, this, this, this bird food, this duck food, whatever it is. What can I do? He said, she said, no, 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 don't worry, I'll clean it up for you. <laughs> so when I came home that day, the first thing I saw was the broken gate. I thought, what's going on here? I drove in, I saw my wife with a big smile, I saw the children laughing at me, and I thought, now I'm in trouble. So I said, what happened? So she told me the story. I said, so you got your duck food? She says, yes. I said, well, God is good. She said, yes. She said, yes. I said, but there's a problem. What about my gate? She looked at me and she said to me something very simple. Your gate, your problem. Abraham was a, the father of faith. He was a sojourner. If you, you know that word sojourner is very interesting. It means living a life of not being attached to anything. He never built a mansion. He never built a house. He never built anything that was stationary or had to stay. He lived in tents. And yet he was rich. Why? Because God blessed him. The funny thing is when we talk about Abraham's faith, we talk about money. And yet when you read in Hebrews chapter 11, it has nothing to do with Abraham's money. It's talking about the fact that Abraham saw a city whose builder and foundation was of God. He was looking at the internal things. He was seeking first the kingdom of God. And God added to him what he needed. 
Let me tell you, if you don't need a better job, be content. If you don't need a better house, be content. Serve God. Put your faith in Him. Put your faith in Him. If your husband doesn't change, be content. If your children don't change, be content. Put your faith in God. Let God take you through the fiery furnace. Let God get you to the other side. Let's have a look. Mark chapter 4. Are you with me this morning? Mark chapter 4. It's amazing when you sit in the, in the, on this outer ring road in the traffic, the time stands still. You come into church and you're told how many minutes you have to preach and it goes like a cyclone. In Mark chapter 4, are you there? Jesus put the disciples in a boat. Every time he put the disciples in a boat, they got into a storm. Every time. You would think they would learn. If I was there, I would have said, no, thank you, I'll take the bus. <laughs> he says in verse 35, let us cross over to the other side. Can you say that with me? Let us cross over to the other side. Tell your neighbor, let us cross over to the other side. So what happened? A great windstorm arose. Verse 37, waves got high. We're coming into the boat. The water was coming into the boat. Jesus in verse 38 says he was sleeping. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, Peace, be still. And the wind was ceased and there was a great calm. And he said, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And you know, for many years as a preacher, I used to preach a message on that if you have faith, you will stand up and rebuke the wind and the waves. Amen? No. If you have faith, you'll be sleeping with Jesus. Because he said, let us cross to the other side. That's where he was going. He had no intention for the boat to be overwhelmed with water. He had no intention for the disciples to perish. None whatsoever. He got into the boat. He declared, we're going to the other side. He slept. If you have faith, you sleep. You enter the peace of God. You enter the rest of God. That's what Hebrews says in chapter 4. There are people who don't enter the rest because they don't mix the word with what? Faith. They never enter peace. You can feel somebody who has faith. You can feel, you can hear their language. You can hear their language. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he talks about the persecution, the hardship, the tough times, the trials, the stress of life. And then he says, we have the same spirit of faith. And he continues in verse 16, and he says, while we do not look at the things that are natural and temporal, we look at the things that are eternal. That's the spirit of faith. But when you meet people and, the, and their, their language is, you know, God is blessing me. How are you? God is blessing you. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the tail, not the head. I'm the tail. Yeah? You listen to their language. You know, I'm driving this little Toyota, but really in my heart, I have harder faith than some Mercedes Benz. Hallelujah. <laughs> when I was a young pastor, we used to have 50 people in the church. It was a big hall. We used to have 50 people in the church. They had 500 chairs. And people, I used to go to pastor's meetings. And pastors are terrible. They'd say, how many people do you have in your church? I'd say 500. But only 50 are coming at the moment. <laughs> that was my faith talk. <laughs> ah, that's not faith that's presumption that's foolishness <laughs> it's foolishness faith believes in God faith lay holds on the eternal life eternal things eternal things that's incredible eternal things and all the natural stuff around us is not eternal the problems are not eternal they're temporary they're here today, gone tomorrow. They, they're there for a while. But faith will take us through. Faith keeps us going. Look with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, what chapter 1. Are you still here? All right. Good, because we're going to take up the offering. So, 1, Corinthians, 1 Peter chapter 1, what does he say? Verse 3, he says, you've been born again to a living hope. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, 
verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through what? Faith. Guys, God's got something rich for us, something eternal. That's what sets us apart from everyone else. That's why the Bible said Caleb had a different spirit, different attitude, different life. He wasn't looking at all these things. He just wanted that mountain. Thank you. He lay hold of it in his heart. He knew it was from God. God has something for us. He wants to conform us and shape us into his image to become like Christ. And the only way that can happen is we're willing to go through the fires. We're willing to go through the storms. We're willing to go through the difficulties. We're willing to go through. You know, when you go to school, you go to grade one. You pass it. You have a test. You pass, you go to grade two. There's no, there's no cheating. And you don't go to grade two unless you've gone through grade one. And it's the same in our Christian life. We grow through, grow through tests. We move through tests, trials, tribulations. You can't resist these in the name of Jesus when they come from him in the first place. The very thing that you're standing against is the very thing you need. Now we're quiet. So wonderful. Are you already blessed me this morning? When two couples, a couple of people stand in front of the altar and you just look at their eyes and it's just full of love. <laughs> you know, do you take him, do you take her for better, for worse? Love. I mean, what do they see? They know nothing. Because before you're married, you don't want to offend anybody. So you do everything what she wants. She does everything what you want. You please, you're happy. But after you're married, a done deal. You're signed, you belong. <laughs> now the real you comes out. Now the real you comes out. And suddenly you realize for the first time in your life that that lovely man that you've married, he doesn't even have hair. He's wearing a wig. And suddenly you realize that that amazing aftershave that he's always wearing is actually his breath. And you think, now I'm in trouble. Because this is not just for a month or a day or for three months, this is for life. <laughs> but it's God's will. God's will. And God adds to that by blessing you with children. One, two, three, four, or some of you, ten. And you think, Lord, what have you done? He says, I blessed you. I blessed you. And your child is just creating havoc and giving you difficulties and making your life miserable. And you think, Lord, what are you doing? He says, I'm blessing you. <laughs> That's where we need to have the heart of Jacob where we grab the angel of God and we say, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let this problem go until you what? You bless me. Until you change me. Because that's what happened. He changed from Jacob to Prince. Something happened in his heart and in life, but he determined not to let go. That's what he is saying. We're laying hold of eternal life. That's why we need faith. Faith keeps us in the go. Faith keeps us in the running. Chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. May the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory, what? By Christ Jesus, after you have, after you have, after you have what? Oh, there's only five of you. After you've what? Uh, a little while. How long is a little while? Could be an hour. Could be an hour. Could be a, a day. But when God thinks one day is a thousand years, let me ask you the question again. <laughs> How long is a little while? Could be a long while. A long while. After you've suffered. Not before, not during, after. You know, when you read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he was always in trouble. And when you read the book of Jeremiah, every single time God comes to him, God says, fear not for I am with you. <laughs> fear not. What does fear not say to you? God is saying fear not because you're about to have a reason to fear. He says, fear not, for I am with you and I will deliver you. What does that mean? You need deliverance. You're about to be in the fire. You're about to go to jail. You're about to be persecuted. You're about to be whatever. But don't worry. I am with you. Hallelujah. And he will take us through. 
I love that. He takes us through the fiery furnace, through the waters, through the storms. Through, through, through. And we come out and we don't have the smell of smoke. Oh man, you know what the smell of smoke is? Bad attitudes. You know, people come through the fire and sometimes you can smell it. How are you? No, I'm fine. <laughs> How's your marriage? It's, it's just going well. You can smell the smoke. You can smell the attitude. You know, I don't know why I was doing so well and we had that problem with, praise God, I'm through it. I'm through it. I'm, I just have so much victory in my life. <laughs> you smell but when you have faith in your heart, faith enables you to see what God wants to do. Faith enables you to go through the fire and think, you know what? That was tough, but I'm changed. I'm changed. God's doing something in my life. I, God's doing something in my life. God's doing something. We know we need to go to the other side. So what does he say? Afterwards, he will strengthen Perfect, which means mature, establish, strengthen, settle you. In other words, grow up. Huh? Tell the child next to you to grow up. <laughs> Some of you didn't have the courage. <laughs> I'm not going to tell that man to grow up. He'll take me outside and lay hands on me. Give me fivefold ministry. <laughs> huh? But we need to grow up. How can we be world changers? How can we make a difference in society when we're like a reed that is so easily bent by all the problems of life? Where we go through one, from one prayer to another prayer, from one session of counseling to another, and we're so easily moved and rocked and swayed. Why? Because we're children. Our eyes are focusing on what is happening at home, what's happening in the finance, what's happening at work, what's happening in the world, society, economy. We watch the news and we think, oh, now what are we going to do? We need to grow up. We need to grow up. And don't put your Sunday face on. Don't put your Sunday face on. It's easy to come to church and look religious. I used to have a, a church and the, the office was at the back and looked onto the car park. And I'll never forget one day a couple arrived in the car and they had two little boys and they were fighting and screaming at each other. The parents were fighting and screaming at each other. They were slamming the car door. And I think, whoa, what is going on there? So I came through the door just as they came through the front door of the church. But a miracle had happened. <laughs> it was like an angel just came upon them. They came holding hands the little boys were behind them walking like, I mean, what an angel. I thought, what a miracle. What had taken place? It was a miracle of religion. Did you hear me? The miracle of religion, having the form of godliness, but there's nothing happening on the inside. It's what's on the inside. That God wants to deal with. That's why he takes us through. If you read Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6 through 8. In fact, chapter 8, he talks about how God took the people of Israel through the promised land. They didn't need new shoes. 40 years in the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you. You may have got bored with one pair of shoes. I'm not sure. <laughs> huh? They didn't need new clothes. They didn't need this. They didn't need that. Why? Because God took after them. God looked after them. And he does the same for us. Now, I'm not against clothes. I'm not against money. If you want to bless me with a Mercedes Benz, I'm ready for you to do that. I didn't hear one amen. Sorry. <laughs> to me, that's not the issue. It's the heart of faith. God can give you what you need. But we're not, we're not to look for it. We're look to look for Him. To keep our eyes on Him. To keep our focus on Him. Let's end. Maybe we can just go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. You know the Bible tells us that God is the author and the what? The finisher of our faith. He is writing the book chapter by chapter, page by page. It's not our book, it's His book. 
We can't take the scriptures and use them and turn them into model airplanes to keep us happy. Are you with me? We need to see what God is saying and take it seriously. We need to realize we're living in dangerous, perilous times where the enemy and the forces of darkness are doing their best to get you away from faith. Faith in God. Faith for your life. Faith that will take you through. He's doing his best. I want to be like Paul who can say, chapter 4 verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Through all of Paul's life, all his hardships, all the storms, all the difficulties, Paul kept the faith in God. Whether he was in prison or out, whether he was shipwrecked or not, whether he was beaten, stoned, rejected, persecuted or not, he kept the faith for his life. He knew God had a plan for him. He knew that God was conforming him into the image of Christ. You are no different. None of us are different. God has something for you. He's got something for me. We can never compete with anyone. We can't compare ourselves with anyone. God has a plan and a purpose for me. Peter McKenzie, my life for you. For you. Faith needs to come in our heart. I want to shake you this morning. I want to rattle you. I want to help you wake up a little bit to see that God has something eternal for your life. No matter what you're facing, no matter what uncertainty or difficulty or trauma or tragedy, God can take you through. He will take you through. And you will come through on the other side and say, I have fought the fight. I've fought the faith. I've kept it. I've finished my race. And your heart is pure and you rejoice. Because you know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or think. What did he do? Did he change everything? No, he changed me. He changed me. Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Oh, I'd love to continue. But let's stand to our feet. Are you here or not here? If you're married... Do not cast that mountain in the sea. That mountain was given to you by God. If you have children, they're from God. Where you're working, no matter how tough, is from God. Your health is from God. He can heal you like that. Or He may decide next week. Keep your faith. 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 I just finished Bible school. I went in to pray for a woman that was dying with cancer. Cancer in the throat and the stomach. She was full of it. She was in agony. She was in pain. I was fresh out of Bible school, full of faith, fire in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I went in there and I was going to make a difference. I'm telling you, I was a very mature 22-year-old. I went into that room. I quoted the Word of God. I pumped my faith up. She prayed for me. I came out. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. She prayed for me. Because she had faith. I was just a fool. I was just immature. Full of pride. Full of arrogance. And here's this woman in absolute agony. And she interrupted me. She took me by the hand. She ignored what I was saying. What I was praying. And she started to pray from her heart. Because she had faith. She was a woman that was seeing eternity. And her prayer for me was simply this. Father, help him to see what's real and what's not. I walked out of that room. I had nothing more to say. That's faith. That's what we need. In every heart, every life. And I want to tell you as parents, that's what we need to bring to our children. To keep their eyes on the Lord. That they will respect themselves for Jesus. They will take care of their body for Jesus. Take care of themselves. My son kept playing a sport, kept getting injured. And one day I looked at him and he was covered with cuts and bruises and broken skin. And I said to him, you are a Christian. You've been bought. You belong to God. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Take care of yourself. And I banned him from 
playing that sport for some months until he recovered. A few months later, I came back from overseas. I was full of flu and bugs and everything. I had to drive up to London for a meeting. My wife said, where are you going? I said, I've got to go to a meeting. As I walked out the house, I met my son. He said, where are you going? I said, I've got to go to a meeting. He looked at me and he said, you've been bought with a price. You belong to God. I heard his message. I went back to bed. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself with faith. Keep your faith going. Keep your faith clear. Father, we pray this morning by your Holy Spirit that you would renew the, the faith of every man and woman in this place. You would bring a faith in the eternal. Lord, for those who have been distracted by natural things, open their eyes. Help them to see the natural things are of no consequence. And help them, Lord, to see that spiritual things are eternal. And what you want to bring in their hearts and their lives. Lord, there are those that are going through marriage difficulties. There are those, Lord, that are suffering in their body. There are those, Lord, suffering in their finance, suffering with home issues, maybe with their sons or daughters. But Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that their faith would keep them going through, through to the eternal things. And that, Lord, you would, you would move by your Spirit. And you would undertake for their marriage and their family and their situation. But Lord, let this faith become like a rock in the hearts and lives of your people this morning. And we will give you the praise and the glory. We're going through the boat, the, the storm. We're in the boat. But Lord, we will get to the other side. And we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Come on.